Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you've just heard, my name is Ben O'Neill. I'm a lecturer at UNSW, and today I'm going to be talking on the topic of natural law and the liberal or equivalently libertarian society. Um, so my talk today is on a subject called jurisprudence. Um, some of you may not know what that is, um, or as my wife asked when I said I was giving a talk on jurisprudence, who is she? <laughs> Um, so who is she? Well, jurisprudence is the theory and philosophy of the nature of law. And it asks the fundamental question of what is law? What constitutes a law? What do we mean when we say that some rule of conduct in society is a law? And consequently, what do we mean when we say that someone is a lawbreaker or a criminal? And uh, jurisprudence seeks to address this question. Now, the reason I think this is an important topic, we've already heard um, reference to natural law, so I'm going to go into that a bit further in this talk. The reason I think this is an important topic is that libertarians and others sometimes suffer from a certain dichotomy in their thinking between the way they think of private criminals and the way they think of government. Now, libertarians are obviously less prone to this than everyone else, but even occasionally we do tend to slip into an error which I'll expose shortly. So I want to start off with an example. I don't have uh, slides of balance sheets, but I do have nice colourful pictures, so I hope that's okay. So suppose that you're walking back from this conference tonight, and God forbid you take a wrong turn down a dark alley near the Reserve Bank, and you're accosted by a mugger with a firearm, perhaps a disgruntled reserve banker that doesn't like the way we speak about them. All right, so let's suppose that this guy demands your wallet at point of a gun, and obviously you comply, not wanting to be shot. He, he has a policy of wallet relief, this mugger, we might say. We might, we might even say that that's his public policy. That's the policy with which he treats the public, is that he has this policy of wallet relief. And you apparently disagree with this policy. You give over your wallet reluctantly. You think that's a bad policy. Now, is that a fair way of characterising that encounter? Okay. And if not, how should we describe it? Now, I put it to you that if this were to happen, you would have no trouble in concluding that the man taking your wallet with a gun is a criminal, okay? and that his actions constitute a crime. And I think if he were to be caught, say, by a policeman and dragged before a magistrate later on and tried to use this way of phrasing it, saying, well, Your Honour, I, I have a policy of uh, wallet relief and, sure, this fellow disagrees with it, but it's all, you know, it's a public policy disagreement here, I think you would probably regard that as really quite a hopeless euphemism for what had actually happened. And, in fact, if you allowed that characterisation of what had occurred to stand, really you've already lost most of the argument against this mugger. Okay? And the reason is that you have now allowed him to whitewash his crime with this euphemism of public policy. You've changed the moral standing in that argument. It is no longer an argument between a criminal and his victim, but now an argument between two people who just happen to have differing views on public policy. And I say that um, even libertarians can be prone to this kind of thinking. It's very common when you uh, start talking about political issues, say to give it a, a concrete example, um, say government intervention into the healthcare industry. And uh, someone will ask you, they'll say, Ben, you're a, you, you're a free marketer, you, you prefer a free market policy, don't you, as opposed to an interventionist policy. And you'll say, yes, you do. But really in conceding that, you're already conceding the language of the debate over to your opponent. You're conceding that what you are arguing over is an issue of what's called public policy. And it's my view that allowing others to characterise libertarian thought in this way without retort, and in particular characterising it this way ourselves without some further elaboration, is already a big weakness in our argument. So I will get to some theories of jurisprudence now. So let's ask ourselves then, the goal of this talk, let's suppose, is to figure out whether this person is a criminal with the actions I've just described. And to do that, 
we're going to make use of various different jurisprudential theories of law. And so we're going to ask ourselves, what makes this mugger's actions a crime? OK, well, here's one possible answer. And this is the one that you would probably get from most people if you ask them. They would say, well, his robbery is a crime because it says so right here in this statute book. OK, so they'd perhaps be able to produce the Crimes Act of New South Wales if this was happening here, go to the relevant section on armed robbery, look it up and say, oh, yes, look, it's not allowed. It's written in this statute book. Now, obviously, that's what a policeman or a prosecutor would rely on if they were asked to make an argument in front of a magistrate about why this man should be sent to prison. Okay, but what we want to consider is, is this an appropriate answer to the jurisprudential question of whether this mugger is a criminal? Well, the theory I've just given you, which makes reference to government statute, is an example of a theory called legal positivism. Now, legal positivism is the assertion that laws are merely a social construct, meaning that the content of law and the existence of law is solely determined by conventions of how people behave, that it has no objective basis beyond that. In other words, it is a social construct. It is constructed from simply social matters, human beings' social conventions. Now, there are various theories um, which fall within this scope of legal positivism, and all of them satisfy that fundamental definition. I want to talk about a few. The first one is a theory um, developed by a legal theorist called John Austin. And he said, OK, if you want to know what laws are, laws are the commands of the sovereign. If there's a, a, an entity in society called a sovereign, and the sovereign he defines as any institution within society that issues commands backed by sanctions and which commands habitual obedience to its commands. Okay? Now, it doesn't have to be obedience by everyone all the time, but it does have to be obedience by most people most of the time. So Austin's theory says if you want to know what law is, look around the society you're in and see if you can identify an institution or a possibly a person, but more likely an institution, that issues commands and is habitually obeyed. If you find such an institution, you've found the sovereign. And its commands are laws, by definition, that that is what law is. So this is the jurisprudential theory. This is Austin's jurisprudential theory of positivism. And so it's easy to see what would happen if we apply that theory to our current society. Clearly, we have these governments above us, both state and federal governments. They are institutions that do issue commands. Those commands are backed by sanctions. And clearly, they are habitually obeyed. Most people at least attempt most of the time to obey them. Okay? And although some people do break the laws, there's a habit of law obedience or command obedience to that sovereign. So under Austin's theory, we would identify both the federal and state governments here as the sovereigns, and we would say that laws are simply what they command, that that meets the defining criteria for law under this theory of positivism. Now I'm going to look at a, uh, a couple of different uh, variations on this positivist idea. One is a, a variation made by a guy called Herbert Hart, again another uh, very well-renowned legal theorist. And he said, well, not all commands of agents of the sovereign have legal force. So if, for example, an ATO bureaucrat was to come up to me on the street and demand my wallet, well, I'd tell him to get stuffed. Okay? But if that same bureaucrat goes through a certain procedure okay, of pushing through legislation through a parliament, and in fact that's already happened, we have tax laws, and then administering those laws and sending me out a very formal letter requiring my money, well, then in that case, I do comply because I fear the consequences of non-compliance. And Hart says that to distinguish those two situations, agents within the sovereign must follow what he called rules of recognition. And these are rules which tell you when an agent is acting on behalf of the institution, can probably be regarded as employing the force of the institution behind them, and when an agent is just off, in, off with the fairies acting in his own uh, personal um, endeavours. Okay? 
Now, the, law, the rules of recognition also have to be habitually obeyed under Hart's theory. So he says, OK, first of all, look around for the sovereign, as with Austin. We find that the government is the sovereign. And then have a look and see, are there any internal administrative rules that agents within this body habitually obey in order to propagate their commands and have these backed by force. And so in this case, if we, again, if we looked around at our society, we would see that there are such procedures that legislation has to be introduced into Houses of Parliament, passed by the parliamentarians there, ad administered by executive ministers and their bureaucrats. And at that point, they satisfy the rules of recognition. And Hart says, OK, well, those are then laws. And those things that follow the rules of recognition, they're laws. Now, one thing about this which is important to note is that this doesn't really constrain the power of the sovereign at all compared to Austin's position. Okay? The constraint it imposes is simply on the agent's ability to act in their personal capacity without satisfying internal procedural rules. So the sovereign, of course, is the body that administers these internal rules as well as issuing external commands. So the sovereign as an institution is still not diminished in its power in any way but it gives it a mechanism that it can keep its agents in check. And so this is how Austin, the Austin slash Hart theory would identify law. Now, if we applied this to our mugger situation, we'd be able to then answer that question in a bit more detail, a bit more philosophical detail than simply saying, well, it's in this statute book. We'd be able then point to the fact that government is the sovereign under Austin's definition, that it has issued commands that have passed through the rules of recognition and that are embodied in criminal law statutes. Those criminal law statutes command private citizens, at least, not to commit armed robbery. And the mugger has obviously done that, contravened that command, therefore he has broken the law and he is a criminal. And that would be a positivist argument in favour of why we would regard this fellow as a criminal. All right, a variation on this argument is a school of thought called legal realism. And the legal realists argued that it's a little bit naive to regard statutory commands and high level abstract commands like that as laws. They said that really those higher level abstract commands are not determinative of the actual practice of the agents of the state, the actual practice of the enforcers of the sovereign. Okay? And so they, uh, there's, there's various quotations from legal realists. The kinds of things they say are, well, you know, a, a judge's decision be, could be determined by what he had for breakfast and that merely he, he uses the law to rationalise his decision. And so they make this argument that the, perhaps it's a little bit naive to regard those commands as embodying what um, the agents of the state do and therefore to be realistic, we need to say that laws are the actual actions of the enforcers of the sovereign. And uh, Justice Holmes, who is a famous legal realist theorist, um, put it this way. He said, law is what judges do. And he didn't mean, si simply mean that judges apply law. He meant, by definition, that is what law is. If a judge has a bad breakfast and convicts someone for such and such, then that is the law, that you shouldn't become, come before a judge who's just had a bad breakfast or whatever. So they say, those things, by definition, are law. And so again, that would give us a theory by which we could figure out, is this mugger a criminal or not? And so in that case, we would simply look at what happens to this mugger. Let's suppose he's caught by the police, he's brought before a magistrate. Now, maybe he's convicted, maybe he's not. Let's suppose that he is, that there's sufficient evidence the magistrate didn't have a, a, any, any other internal reason for letting him go and he sentences him. Then we would say, well, that mugger is a criminal because Magistrate X said he is, and law is what judges do. So that's the legal realist argument for the nature of law. Again, a positivist theory in the sense that it regards law as a social construction. Now, another theory um, that is related to uh, the positivist conception um, by a theorist called Ronald Dworkin, again, another uh, very august uh, legal theorist, he says that actually the command theory of law and legal realism, they don't really capture the essence of law well enough. And he says, okay, the way that you figure out what law is, 
is rather than looking at the commands of the sovereign or the, or the present enforcement agent, actions of the agents, is that you look at their past actions. You look at the past actions of all of the agents which make up the sovereign. And you go through, and, and that constitutes the legal system. So um, he was interested in describing the legal system as it exists. So you see that there are government courts and police stations and so on and these agencies tasked with enforcing the law. And he said the way you figure out law is you look at those actions and you interpret them by a method called constructive interpretation. And he said the way that you do this is that you regard laws as whatever principles best explain those past actions, explain or justify all that past practice. This is a kind of an empiricist view. Okay, that past set of actions is your data. Okay, you've got a whole lot of case law of what judges did and you've got a whole lot of statute books of what commands were issued from Parliament. You can regard that as your data and from that you try to figure out what theory best justifies those past actions, whether it be a moral theory or something else, and then you can say, well, that theory is law, at least under an interpretive theory of law. Now, obviously, the limitation of that from a libertarian point of view is that it pre-presumes recognition of an existing legal system. Okay, you have to start with a recognised legal system to know what you're interpreting. Okay, since the interpretive approach says, take that institution's past actions and figure out what principle best justifies it, and that is law. So we presume at the outset that this legal system is, the le is a genuine legal system. Okay, and so for that reason it cannot really grapple with the problem of saying, is this system applying law? and we want to figure out what law is under a jurisprudential argument, it instead presumes that legal system and says whatever it does is law or whatever principles rationalise that is law. Um, that, that's one of the various arguments Dworkin makes. He, he makes some other very sensible arguments. Um, this is one particular example of a, a positivist kind of uh, method called in constructive interpretation. So now that I've gone through those um, each of their definitions. I just want to kind of reiterate what those three uh, theories of positivist law are saying in their boldest form. Okay? So if we imagine the sovereign, the sovereign, remember, is any agency that is habitually obeyed. And so in a sense it's simply describing the powerful. It is an agency which is powerful and by that virtue alone or vice alone, depending on your, your view, it is the sovereign. So we're now able to say in the boldest form what the positivist theories of law say. So standard legal positivism a la Austin and Hart says laws are the commands of the powerful, where the powerful is understood to be any institution which commands habitual obedience. The legal realists, realists excuse me, say no, 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 laws aren't the commands of the powerful. Laws are the enforcement actions of the powerful, of policemen and judges and so on. And interpretivists who look at the government legal system say, no, 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 each of those theories are deficient also. Laws are the best possible ex post facto rationalisations for the past actions of the powerful. All right, now, I'll, I'll just leave that slide up a minute. It's my contention that how I've stated these is not a misrepresentation of these theories. It's simply stating them in their boldest, clearest form, stripped of all the various euphemisms. Okay? They're described with a little more nuance in the literature, but essentially this is what these three theories are saying. And it's quite extraordinary when you think about these theories to realise that those th three theories between them command the assent of the vast majority of the legal profession and uh, the philosophical profession related to jurisprudence. That most legal theorists adopt one or more of these various definitions of what law is. Now so far we've talked only about cases where we have this mugger who is a private criminal who is committing what we clearly know is a crime. And all of the positivist theories we saw there actually accord nicely with that fact. They do make the conclusion that yes, this guy is a criminal 
And so if we were only looking at that situation, you might say, OK, well, look, these positivist theories have done well. They've correctly um, identified this guy as a criminal. That accords with our moral intuitions. And so they seem to be good theories. But what about cases where positive law and morality diverge? OK, so some examples here I want to mention, uh, two in particular. One is the institution of slavery. And the other is an ex a more, more recent example of um, the laws under Nazism in Germany. So I'll just take the example of slavery first. So suppose that we're transported back into a society in which overt slavery exists. And uh, I don't need to be too specific about that fact. It suffices to note that there have been an awful lot of societies like this historically. Well, how do we interpret this under positivism? Well, let's suppose that instead of this mugger example, we now have a fugitive slave attempting to escape from his slave master. And the slave master, let's suppose, captures the escaping slave and as a warning to the other slaves to try to make sure they don't escape, he executes this slave. Okay. Is he a criminal? Okay, so again, we're asking the jurisprudential question. And again, I'm going to have a look at these positivist theories to see what they say. Well, the positivist theories, all three of them, again, would identify the relevant government there as the sovereign, being that it is the body that is habitually obeyed. And depending on which of those three theories you use, you get a slightly different argument. But all of them would come to the same conclusion, namely that the slave master is not a criminal, he is acting in accordance with the commands of the sovereign, or alternatively the enforcement actions of the sovereign, or alternatively the best ex post facto rationalising principles of the sovereign's past actions, which of course included enslaving people or allowing the enslavement of people. So under positivism, actually the criminal is not the slave master who has enslaved and murdered this poor man, it is the slave. The slave is a criminal for violating the commands of the sovereign. And the slave master is a victim of crime. Okay. And when we think of victims of crime more in more, more, more modern terms, we think of people filling out victim impact statements. So you can only imagine the kind of victim impact statement that such a person would have to fill out. But that's what the positivist view says. Now, they're not, they don't tend to describe slave masters as victims of crime. But nonetheless, positivists are aware in their defence of this divergence between law and morality under their theory. Okay? So in fairness to the positivists, this does not mean that they are necessarily in favour of slavery. They're all, any of the theorists that I've mentioned are not in favour of slavery. And they'll tend to say, well, OK, this is law, but it is a bad law. And we sympathise with the slave and he should break the law by trying to escape and the slave master shouldn't obey the law by enslaving him or capturing him or killing him. So positivism asserts that there is no inherent or necessary connection between morality and law. Now Dworkin's theory allows that there may be some connection through people's beliefs because after all he's searching for the best rationalising principle for the past actions of the sovereign and it's possible that those rationalising principles may include the moral beliefs of the people administering the legal system. And so in that sense, they can be connected epistemologically through beliefs, but they cannot be connected um, in terms of a logical connection. So even under that theory, there is still no direct connection between law and morality. And so positivists can be critical of positive laws such as slavery or the uh, actions of the Third Reich under Nazism. But they must regard them as valid laws, at least under, under those um, th particular theories I've given. All right, so we're now going to turn to an alternative theory, which you've heard mentioned previously, I'm going to elaborate on a bit, called the theory of natural law. And if you're not satisfied with the positivist responses that I've put up there, perhaps the natural law argument may be a little bit more amenable to your thinking. Now, natural law fundamentally says that law is not a social convention. Okay, so unlike positivism, which says that law is purely a social construct, natural law says no, law is something objective. And as a result, it is something immutable and universal. It is something derived objectively from aspects of nature. And in particular, natural law theories 
uh, will all attempt to derive some kind of objective ethical principles from the nature of man and his actions. Okay, so they'll look at various theories of what man is in terms of his basic nature and how he behaves in terms of his actions and seek to derive a set of ethical principles objectively from that. Now under the libertarian view, incidentally libertarianism is not the exclusive uh, view of a theory of natural law. It's possible that you could come up with a theory of natural law for some other view, say socialism or something else. What's critical is that it's an attempt to derive objective ethical principles from the nature of man and it's a repudiation of this idea that law is purely a social con uh, construct. So within libertarianism, um, there are various arguments put in favour of natural law. Um, I'll just briefly mention a few. I won't comment on, on the relative merits of the, those views, just mention them. Uh, one is the Rothbardian argument um, in which Rothbard attempts to establish objective ethical principles pertaining to the use of force on the basis of rational first appropriation rules. And Professor Hopper talked about um, that in, in his uh, speech last night, I believe. Um, also, there was a, an, another theory which uh, is uh, the genesis is in, uh, again, Professor Hopp's work, that uh, objective ethical principles may be derived from presuppositions to the fact that people engage in argument and discussion at all. And so it, it may be possible to derive objective ethical principles axiomatically from simply the fact that when you engage in that kind of action, you're already making presumptions about what you must have accepted. And uh, there are various other arguments. Uh, Ayn Rand puts forward uh, an argument in favour of natural law on the basis of her exposition of the nature of man and the proper actions and the proper beneficiary of actions under uh, ethical theory of rational egoism. And there are also various other um, arguments in favour of natural law. Some of them draw on consequentialist arguments. Most of them are deontological in the sense that they do not rely on looking at the consequences of particular ethical um, types of rules. Okay, and I, as I said, I won't comment on the merits of those just to mention what they are. What I'm interested in here is the fact that all of those justifications, whether you agree with this particular justification of libertarianism or not, all of them seek to ground ethical principles in the nature of man. And they all say something about the way man is as a creature, the actions he performs, and attempt to induce from that objective ethical principles, which are not social constructs, which are immutable and universal. Again, applying this to the situation of the mugger, we can now see why we could regard the mugger as a criminal under natural law. So under natural law, we wouldn't point to a statute book or to any particular command of a parliament or to the actions of a policeman or a judge or anything like that, or to any social circumstance we would simply say it can be determined from the nature of man that armed robbery is objectively immoral behaviour, that that is an objectively immoral use of force. And as such, it is an objective ethical statement about the, about the use of force, which is the content of what we're talking about when we talk about law. And the mugger has defied that ethical principle. He's gone ahead and committed armed robbery and therefore he is a criminal. He has breached natural law. Okay? He's a criminal whether or not he is regarded as a criminal by those around him, whether or not he is caught, whether or not he is convicted. He is a criminal regardless of the beliefs of those in his society. Even if he and everyone else believe he is not a criminal, still he is a criminal under the immutable theory of natural law, assuming that you believe that such can be derived. And now we've, we've looked at the mugger example. Okay, this can also be applied to the slavery example. And here is where the natural law theorists disagree with the positivists. The positivists said the slave is the criminal, the slave master is the victim of crime, albeit we might sympathise with the slave. We're not saying we're totally cold-hearted bastards. We, we think it's good that the slave is breaking this bad law which we don't like. But nevertheless, it is a law. Natural law theorists say, well, maybe it's not a law, at least under a natural law interpretation. No, it is not a law. 
And in fact, slavery, the institution of slavery, is a breach of those objective ethical principles. And so the slave is the victim of crime. The slave master is a criminal, despite the fact that he is not viewed that way by the society he is in and by the sovereign power. All right, so this gets us then to the question of semantics. Okay. Um, I've said that you can derive objective ethical principles um, from the nature of man, that libertarians do this. And let's suppose that we accept that that's true. Um, now, it's also true that the things referred to by legal positivism, they are also useful concepts. It is true that there is such an institution in society that is habitually obeyed. There is such an institution, and it is useful to have a concept to identify it. And it is also useful to have a concept to identify its commands that it is going to enforce on you whether you like it or not. So Austin's theory of positive law is a useful concept for describing who is in charge and what they do. And similarly, le the legal realism is a useful concept in describing what actually do judges do? What do they rule against you or in your favour? And similarly, Dworkin's interpretive theory is useful in understanding what is the best rationalisation for the government's behaviour, albeit a very bad rationalisation. So these all describe something useful and they can be used. So I'm, I, I don't want you to misunderstand me and think I'm standing here saying positive law is nonsense and natural law is true. What I'm saying is they all describe useful concepts. The question is which has the highest claim to the accolade of law? Um, now, in deciding this question, there's a good quote from Herbert Hart in his book, The Concept of Law. I'm not going to give you the full quote, just an excerpt of it. He says that whatever choice we make should assist our theoretical inquiries or advance and clarify our moral deliberations. So he says this is not an arbitrary choice. This is not just an arbitrary linguistic issue. When we're thinking about is natural law law or is positive law law, that's what we should be trying to do. Assist our theoretical inquiries and advance our moral deliberations. Now obviously that question depends on the context. What are we using the concept for? Now if I'm audited by the Australian Tax Office and I need to go to court and defend myself, a, an understanding of natural law theory will not assist me because the court will not recognise that. And in that case, I actually want the legal realist interpretation of what will a judge rule? Will a judge rule against me or for me if I make this argument? What are the commands of the sovereign? I need an actual lawyer, positive law lawyer, to tell me those things. And so in that context, I think you could say that the positive law concepts are more useful in that concept, in clarifying your theoretical inquiries. But in our present theoretical inquiry, we're not interested in that question. We are interested in the jurisprudential question, is this mugger a criminal? And I think in that question, natural law is head and shoulders above positivism. Well, the positivists say that, OK, they might accept the existence of objective ethical principles. They don't like calling them natural law. They think that's a wrong thing to call it. And, they, and their argument is that this confuses people. Okay. They say that really it's confusing to mesh in positive law and objective ethical principles and that you're only going to start confusing the discussion if you start saying that the slave is actually the victim of crime and the slave master is a criminal notwithstanding that he obeyed the sovereign. So really which does confuse things though and which clarifies things? If we're trying to figure out whether the mugger is a criminal, presumably what we want to do is judge his actions and yet it is only natural law that does that. The positive law theory makes it impossible by its very definition to judge whether the sovereign is itself a criminal entity. So if we're asking ourselves, is the sovereign committing a crime? Positive law cannot possibly assist our deliberations in that theoretical inquiry because it is concerned with defining law by the commands of the powerful. And you've already seen my exposition of my bald face um, explanation of what those theories say. So really they can't advance that inquiry. So I would say that actually far from confusing things in that instance, it is the positivist theory that confuses things and the natural law theory that is the only possible theory by which you can answer that. The positive law theory preempts the answer before even undertaking any investigation. It begs the question 
philosophically speaking. And so it cannot assist you, simply because, as I said, it defines law by reference to the whims of those in power, which makes it impossible to determine, are those in power criminals? All right, so why does this matter for libertarians? I hope the answer is fairly obvious. Libertarian theory says that natural law exists. And what I mean by that is it says that it is possible to derive objective ethical principles pertaining to the use of force from the nature of man and his actions. And in particular, the content of the libertarian theory implies that government is not a legitimate enterprise, that it is a criminal agency, that many of its actions, and in fact the defining actions that make it a government, are criminal in nature. And therefore, it is simply impossible for a government to not be a criminal agency. It must by its very definition. I won't elaborate on that. I think that's been um, elaborated on already. But we can see that only a natural law theory is ca capable of investigating that. Now, the reason that this is important, I said at the start that if you allow the mugger to make this an issue of public policy, you've already lost. And the same is true when we talk of government and government actions. You need to understand that this idea of public policy is simply a euphemism for government crimes, government actions that amount under natural law to crimes. And so when libertarians allow themselves to be co-opted into a debate in which the terms of reference are framed as a, say, free market policy versus an interventionist policy, if they go exclusively to those abstract principles, as informative as they are, if at no stage they devolve down into the concrete issue of crime versus obedience to natural law, they've already, in my view, lost the debate. Or at least they have expressed their theory in a very weak manner. Now, I often write my articles in this way. I'll say things like this. And and I sometimes get the retort from some libertarians to say, well, look, that scares people off, OK? You don't want to sound unreasonable. And when you start making statements like the government is a criminal agency, that scares people off. And what you, you should reframe it. You should say, I'm in favour of a free market anti-interventionist policy, this. And you should reframe it in terms of that policy debate, since that is the accepted debate structure within our society. But it's precisely because that's the accepted debate structure, that's precisely the thing we need to challenge. Libertarians ultimately have one very simple request, just one request, and that is that people should not commit crimes. All of this um, higher level abstraction of, well, we favour free market, anti-interventionist healthcare policy or non-interventionist foreign policy, those are simply more abstract ways of stating that we would prefer it if people did not commit crimes. And I think it's very important that we constantly reiterate that simple message. Um, I was going to talk about the Nazis and the Nuremberg trial, but I think I'm running low on time. I'll, I'll just briefly mention the fact that if you have a look into the Nuremberg trial, I, I know a gentleman over here mentioned the Nuremberg defence. This is actually one of the great accomplishments of the Orwellian memory hole. The Nuremberg defence supposedly is the defence that um, obedience, um, that, that, well, we, we may have committed crimes, but we were just obeying orders, okay? Actually, that is not the Nuremberg defence. That is one of two Nuremberg defences, the other of which is virtually lost to popular understanding, which was not, well, we're committing crimes, but we were obeying orders, but no, we are not committing crimes because the Third Reich is the sovereign. Its commands constitute the law. We are obeying the law. And it is precisely the fact that the, the Nazis did invoke this positive law defence at the Nuremberg trials, and that's very much forgotten now, you know, for obvious reasons. But I think we need to bring those issues back always to the issue of law versus crime, law versus crime. That is the primary issue of libertarianism. Thank you very much. <laughs>